Welcome to Group Text. I am so happy to have Kathleen Madigan with me today. She is one of the most prolific and most visible comedians out there, 33 years in the business. Kathleen tours two-thirds of the year in addition to hosting her weekly podcast, Madigan's Pubcast. Her latest comedy special, Hunting Bigfoot, is streaming now on Amazon Prime. Please welcome Kathleen Madigan. Hi, Kathleen. Hello. It's nice to nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you too. And before we get to hunting Bigfoot, I want I have some questions about things that I discovered about you. Okay. So you are one of seven kids. Yes. Raised by middle class parents in the Missouri suburbs. Yes. We're they your first audience because we know that eight people is not a bad crowd some places. <laughs> <laughs> there <laughs> well i never thought that people in my family were funny until my sister dated this like german guy and he would come over and try to tell a story and we were all like oh wow he doesn't like get it like we i, th- I think we are f- every my brother's super funny like my brother could be his dad i think we were all funny i just don't think i think there's just families that aren't funny and then i didn't know that until i met them and then I was like, oh, wow, there's like, like, you guys just don't get it. And then I even tried to help my sister's boyfriend at the time, the German guy. I'm like, here's where your story got too long. And then we all drifted out. This is why this is why we didn't care anymore, because you over explained that middle part. And then he was like, oh, OK, so they should be shorter. But you can't teach somebody like you just don't tell a story. Just don't, Bob. Don't you, tell a story. We can't we'll teach do timing. You can't teach no. timing. No, and you can't teach like the instinct of did you need to say that extra paragraph? <laughs> no, no, you didn't. You sure didn't. It's like we were a terrible audience to outsiders, but inside we were a good audience. I bet you guys had a lot of inside jokes, and I bet there were times you guys would just start be- busting out laughing, and no yeah. one knew why because that happened in my family all the time. Yeah, the amount that has gone on, and also when there's I have six siblings, so it's a total of nine people. Um, it's every man for himself. Like my one neighbor, is, they used to say, I love you a lot. And like my friend Chuck goes, you guys don't say I love you. I'm like, no, they, they need to wake up and wonder how I feel about them. <laughs> it, sh- it shouldn't be a given. I don't, maybe I don't love you today. I loved you yesterday, but you could do something totally screwed up today. And then it's over. Like there's just, that, we didn't have that lovey-dovey. It was more, um, sarcastic uh and kind of even to this day like uh, even the special my dad's like well i really thought the sound was good <laughs> okay <laughs> like he goes don't fire that sound guy keep him on keep him on the payroll like i don't travel with a sound guy dad that was just a guy that was the thing but like they'll just give me crap about that too so i love that really and how was the rest of the play mrs lincoln <laughs> well, he is kind of deaf, so I'm, the sound does matter more to him. But yeah, like they don't, they're all over it too. Like I didn't even hear from my brother today. I'm like, dude, come on. The thing just came on Amazon. Nothing. He's too busy. Call you back. I ain't got time for you. <laughs> Where are you in the sibling order? In the middle, which is the sweet spot. Because no one's paying attention. They pay attention to the oldest and the baby. Everyone else in the middle, you're free to roam the country. It's like Southwest. Bang, you're free to go. My parents paid. When I said I'm going to go be a comedian, I expected some backlash. No. They were like, well, have fun in the circus. Let us know. Do you know where Philadelphia is at? I go, well, no, but I'm going to get a map and I'm going to drive there. Okay, bye. (laughs) That was it. I was like, wow, I thought, you know, I finished college and stuff. I thought you'd want me to get a real job. Nope. Nobody seemed to care. Well, you know, you can't, they couldn't say, text me when you get there. No, I don't, unless I called them. They never even called to find out if I got there. I mean, they would eventually learn, I guess, if I died. But, you know, someone would tell them. But other than that, (laughs) they're not, they were not interested in keeping track of our ongoings. You tell us when something's happened and then we'll, we'll, we'll show up. And they're fun. They're fun. It's just, they're not, there's too many of us to keep track of what everybody's doing every Thursday and Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they, you know, 
you, I call them. It's like we all call into headquarters and tell them what we're doing, and then yeah, that blah blah. Um, obviously, your family's been a source for endless material. Um, do you, have you done anything where they get offended? Uh, no, but I have insurance on that. I make sure that they all are invited to some big ass deal every year somewhere awesome. So even if they had the inkling to complain, they might want to rethink that complaint or all of a sudden you're not going to be at the Mirage for the weekend in Las Vegas, are you, Patrick? No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so they know if they just play along, good things will come. But if you start, if you start bitching, you know, no, I'll pull the rug out. Just like that. Faster. Yeah. You'll be stuck with your own bar tab. <laughs> yeah. That, that free beer backstage won't be free beer anymore, Pat. Yeah. Not so free. <laughs> <laughs> not so free. Uh, I also read that you were very athletic as a kid. Was the whole family? Uh, well, everybody plays sports. That's why Lewis Black's one of my best friends. And he's always like, well, yeah, me, we weren't doing that, Kathleen, because we're Jewish. We were smarter. We were inside reading. Yeah, I was going to say, Lewis Black, not athletic. Not athletic. He does play golf. It's his only does, thing he does outside. Does he do it well? Some days, yes. Okay, that's I generous. Mean, it's it's sometimes awkward. Um, it's not what I would call a natural golf swing. But <laughs> but it, it's been worked on with a lot of help. <laughs> And uh, yeah, he can occasionally, he'll get a hold of a five iron that even my mind is like, I can't believe he just did that. Because otherwise, Lou's not an outdoor outdoor cat. He's an indoor cat. Yeah. Like if I say, go, let's go take a walk in the woods. He just starts bringing up Lyme disease and, you know, things that can kill us in the woods. And I'm like, that never would have occurred to me, Lewis. Like, yeah. we're not going to die on a trail in Nashville. No, no one's no one's dying out here. We might die on stage, but not in the woods. <laughs> right. We're all we're by ourselves. Nothing bad's gonna happen, I promise. But um yeah, I mean I I have I have four brothers and two sisters. Everyone's athletic. Even my mom and dad, they still golf every day. Everybody's always doing something. You are not allowed to sit around. When they, my dad was like captain activity. So we all did something. And uh I did win the Missouri Hoop Shoot Championship in fifth grade. I was going to yeah. ask you about that because you also set the record for being the shortest. The shortest. At four, and then, foot five, at four feet, five inches. I think that's right. And underhanded. And I'm not embarrassed to say that. Shaquille O'Neal should have listened to me years ago because there was an NBA guy who did it underhanded. And he wasn't scared. He wasn't embarrassed. Who cares as long as it goes in? Right. And uh, after I got 15 out of 15, I retired. I never played just, basketball again. It was new just... Oh, I was too short. All of a sudden, everybody was like five seven, and I was still five. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I can't. Yeah, I'm not no, this. A, I'm not athletic enough to overcome that. Well, I was gonna say, but it's good. You knew when to hang it up. That's right. You got to get out while you're on top. Exactly. There's a lot <laughs> of athletes that should take that advice. There's many um, out there. Yeah, exactly. So, what were your big sports? Well, the good thing is we moved to the Ozarks uh, when I was in high school, like the show Ozark. Okay, by the way, no, I've never heard anyone say it was good we moved to the Ozarks. <laughs> we bought a family resort just like the show, for real. It was called Madigan's Last Resort. But the high school there, um, they didn't have enough kids, so you could play on every team if you just showed up. So I can't really say I was athletic. I was just available. <laughs> Like even on the track team, I'm like, all I did was run a mile and go in the woods and smoke a cigarette. The whole thing was so stupid. I couldn't <laughs> believe that like my parents, I'm like, I just go, I'm so slow. And all I do is go out there and smoke with Ashley, my friend. Why do you insist I keep doing this? Oh, well, it keeps you busy. Get out there. So I don't know if it was athletic or more just like, I know how to do it and I'm available. There's a lot of things that that could apply to. <laughs> it's, many... probably, it's probably most things in life. It's probably yeah. why most people have a job. Yeah. I'm available and I can kind of do it. Or have repeat dates. <laughs> <laughs> or stay in relationships. Exactly. What I'm are the available. other options? <laughs> right. um, you originally wanted to be a journalist. And in the midst of getting your college degree, 
your parents, are, your dad's like, you're funny. I mean, most parents in their right mind do not suggest that their kid goes into comedy. No, but I mean, even I think people my age, I didn't understand that was a job. Like when I would watch Johnny Carson as a kid and let's say Buddy Hackett came on. Right. Or, or your mom came on. I just thought those were funny friends of Johnny's. I didn't understand that they then went to Las Vegas and did those jokes and made money. I just, I didn't think it was a job until a comedy club opened in St. Louis and me and my friend, Mike, we were bartending together. We just would go over there to drink when we got off work and we started watching open mic nights and we're like, well, we've said funnier things this week than anything I've heard here tonight. Right. So then we, then we just started trying it for fun. It wasn't like I ever thought of it because I wouldn't have thought of it because I didn't know it was a job right. that you could make money. I thought, I don't know. I think when you're sitting on shag carpet in the Midwest too, that all seems very far away. Like Los Angeles and Hollywood and New York, it seems like, oh, those people do that. And then we live in the middle. <laughs> right. we're, we're supposed to do whatever we're supposed to do. Hold down the fort, I guess. We're supposed to just keep everything kind of, you know, we got a farm. We need cereal, breakfast. Right. I didn't understand they made money like that. Um, you ha- got your, did you get your degree in journalism or just did you? I did. I did yeah. Okay. Do you find it? You know, so many comics or most comics are very observational. Does your do you think studying journalism has taken you to a new level though in in disseminating stories, dam- boiling it down to what it really is, and then being able to make a joke about it? Because I think people don't realize how smart comedians are because you have to be to get the joke. Well, I'm always amazed when people that had degrees in what I consider super hard things like quit to do comedy. Like Greg Giraldo was a Harvard lawyer. Yeah. And we're sitting in some skanky comedy club. And I'm like, you quit being a lawyer? I mean, I just quit working at a dumb magazine in the Midwest. It didn't matter. Or Jeff Fox, he has an engineering degree. Like where I'm like, oh, my to me, that's like a real job. Oh, because it is. Yeah, you had real opportunities. Like I, my journalism was kind of, it's a little bullshitty. I can write a story. It's fine. But I'm not like going to be on 60 Minutes uncovering a, a chemical plant leak in Southern Illinois. I mean, I'm not that, I'm not that lady. So I, I only picked journalism because I was so bad at science and math. There's not many other choices left. The only thing I think journalism did is I do edit well because there's nothing I hate than too many words. And a long time ago, Comedy Central made us type out one time everything we were gonna say like in a 20 minute thing. And even then when I typed it out, I had too many words. And I think I'm really good with not having too many words. And on paper, I was like, oh my God, I said the 18 times in one sentence. That wasn't necessary, Kathleen. So I think journalism did that. Like, and it does make you question things or look at things in a different way than just accept the story. Right. I mean, not, I'm not crazy. I'm not QAnon crazy, but I mean, I do question things or (laughs) I don't, I'm not that that far out of it, but yes, I do think it makes you question things more. Cause again, like I said, most comedians are smart. Although when they give up a Harvard law degree, you do want to say, God, you're dumb. And your mother's crying and your mother's crying somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Lewis went to, I knew Lewis for three years. And then one day he goes, he told me he went to university of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Okay. Got it. And then he said, I, I'm so sick of Yale asking me for more money. I said, why would Yale, why would Yale ask you for money? He goes, well, cause I still owe him money. I said, for what? He said, well, I went to graduate school there. Lewis has a degree in playwriting from Yale. And we are at the Omaha Funny Bone. <laughs> or as we used to say, you're at the, at, uh, was it Yuck Yucks? <laughs> yeah, in Canada, the, all the Yuck Yucks are in Canada. And I said, are you crazy? Like you have a degree from Yale and you're sitting here with me at a bar in Omaha drinking whiskey. What went wrong on your end? <laughs> because I'm doing fine. I'm doing exactly what I should be doing. You should be, his mother, I don't think ever quite got over it. Well, as I'm saying, his mother is still somewhere 
crying quietly. Yes. Um, so you've been in the business for 33 years and you still tour almost 250 dates a year. Either you hate where you live or there is something very, very <laughs> wrong for you or you're running from the mob. I don't, cannot figure this out. That's what. That's- that's why, why I hide. that's why yeah. I hide in the Ozarks. Exactly. What is it that makes you love being on the road? I love the road and I don't understand why. Well, I don't know. When I see comics on the road, I'm either like you're all in or you're not. But there's no middle ground to me of, well, I like traveling like one Saturday every. Oh, my God. The. I think it's because all I want to do is be a comedian. I don't want to be an actor. I don't want to be in a sitcom. I don't want to be in a movie. I don't. I just want to tell jokes in front of live people. And I want to do that for an hour and a half. And then I want to leave and go to a bar. And then I get to go everywhere. I mean, I still like, like, it's, it's, it's gone the loop where first you go to these cities and I did all the touristy things that you should do. Then you make friends. Then I go back and now I see my friends and I don't do the touristy things. But it's been so long now since I've done some of them, I go and do them again. I just think you have to like to, I think I do better. Maybe it's because it's from a big family. I do better in organized chaos, not chaos, chaos, organized chaos. I don't like monotony. I don't like repetition. Like my sister had twins and then another baby. I said, I'll come home and help you. I was there for two weeks and I was just ready to like throw myself off a bridge. The kids are nice, but I'm like, this is, we do the same thing every day. I wake up, I feed them, then they crawl around for a while, take a nap. And we do this every, by day five, I was like, oh my God, I got to get out of here. Because she kept looking at me going, you're going to leave, aren't you? I mean, you said you'd stay. I was like, yeah, I am. I know I said two weeks. I can't do it. Call mom. I can't do it. I'm out. (laughs) Tapping out. Yeah, I tapped out like a wrestler. I'm like, I left the baby in his playpen in the front room. I'm like, I'm out. I can't do it. (laughs) <laughs> I I made sure he had enough to eat, like the cat. <laughs> I've Don't worry about it. His diapers. <laughs> He's good. He's good. Pinned a little note. Pinned a little note to him. <laughs> you meet all sorts of interesting and interesting. I'm trying to be nice about strange lit on the road. What what has been your most bizarre encounter? I just had one recently on my book tour that I was like. I, I I was doing a, a talk, like a Q&A, and it was someone on the front row who kept like nodding at me. And I'm like, I know this person. I know this person. I know this person. So I'm like making eye contact. I'm doing this. And I find out afterwards, I have never met this person in my entire life. But they felt oh, so right. attached to me and my family that literally they were making me feel like I knew. And I'm like, I have never met you. That's weird. And then the other time I had a woman argue with me about where I went to high school. That was bizarre. <laughs> Did, who won? <laughs> I finally capitulated. I had no choice. The only really strange thing, and it's always because of the podcast. That's what I found so weird. Like, a hundred years I've been on the road. Nobody brought me presents backstage, which is fine. I don't need any presents. But since I do this, this the podcast and I drink drink drinks on it and taste food, I was a, people bring presents, which is super nice. But I was doing a casino gig and out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw a lady running towards the stage and then she leapt on the stage, but it was super high and she was pretty chubby. So she only made she only made it halfway, and then it was like watching a person go like this, where her balance was off, and then a Hallmark card shot across the stage right by my feet, and I thought, "Huh, okay, I'm not going to address that right now." But then I thought, "I have to." Everyone saw that, so I went and, and like it's a casino. The security people will come get you for stuff like that. You can't just right. jump on, and then. And then I opened the card and it just said, hi, welcome to Phoenix. You went through all that. <laughs> Did you say welcome to Phoenix? Like you could have just given that to an usher. They'd have brought it backstage. Like it was just a very, um, 
I don't think I ever felt like somebody was going to physically capture me. Had she weighed less, she might have captured me. <laughs> but still, at, at, but at the corner of her eye, you see all this action. Yeah, and she waited because there's four security guards, two in the back and two right here on the stage, but they rotate every 15 minutes. So she waited for the rotation and then ran, gave it, her, gave it a good go and full speed on because I thought, I think I see that no one else does. Security? Anybody? Well, it was no. very Ocean's Eleven. Clearly, she had watched <laughs> yeah. and timed. Yeah. Well, because it didn't happen until about halfway through my act. So she had watched about 35, maybe maybe 40 minutes and then realized, here's my, here's my entryway. Oh, God. And, yeah. And then I, they went and, I don't know, got her or whatever. But normally, my people are just educated, borderline, well-behaved alcoholics. Yeah. They're not, they're not going to do anything like Lewis has had some crazy people because he talks about politics so much. And then you turn up the dial with the Trump stuff. And if I said, if I were you at, I mean, Lewis is older than me. I would not want to put up with that on a nightly basis, but he thrives on it. So, you know what you have at it, Lou, but I, I wouldn't want that to be a thing. Cause it's one scary. time it's crazy because there's people I made all the jokes you want to make about Mitt Romney, Dan Quayle, Bill Clinton. Nobody cared. One time I had a joke about Sarah Palin, some old drunk lady in Florida from a, the a very nice fancy theater in the balcony screamed, I love you and I love Sarah Palin. Don't do it, Kathleen. I didn't even said anything yet. I just said her <laughs> name. It, I said, well, you can't love me and Sarah. You got to pick. And you're already here tonight. So I would choose me. And then I don't know what happened. But the joke was innocuous anyway. It was, I remember the joke. It wasn't mean if she would have just given it a chance. But she, you know, instead got kicked out. But I love the fact that she's telling you, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> you don't even know what I'm going to do. Yell at me afterwards. But you don't, what if I was going to say I love Sarah Palin? You don't know. I might have well, said like, it. It's like when your child is going for like the hot stove and you're like, ah, ah, this, nah, ah, ah, don't. Don't, don't. Yeah. Um, she warned me. Yeah. Cancel culture, and I always get asked this. How, and you're very much an observational comic. How hard has it been, or was it hard, because I think things are getting back to normal, to not be fearful and self-edit? Because self-editing is the enemy of a comedian, especially when they're trying out new material, which will take us back to the special because it's your sixth and people don't realize once you do a special, all that material is out the window. For the most part. Yeah. I'll keep yeah. a few things just because people like to hear it, but right. yeah, it's, but yeah, that's why I got to, I don't ever go into subjects that are super duper uh, controversial as a rule. Like I'm talking about my family in the middle. I do talk about politics as from a distance, but I don't really. I'm not really necessarily trying to convince anybody of anything or change anyone's mind. Um, I think, I think cancel culture, a lot of it is consequence culture and people at the end of the day, if you, I treat comedy, like, yes, it's what I want to say, but it's also a job. Someone is paying me. And as soon as I become a pain in the ass enough, that person will not want to pay me anymore. So you can say whatever you want in your house. You can say whatever you want to your friends. But once you have an employer, like I was following Bill Cosby in those theaters down in Florida. He was, go he was right before me. And it was when he had been accused. But nobody knew. But these protesters were coming. And they were super smart. They bought the middle of the rows. I never thought about that. So now the ushers in Florida, who are also 90 years old volunteering, they're like my mom. They don't know what to do. They can't get to you. So now they got to hire cops and now they got to hire security. So if you're booking that venue, is it easier to go, well, I'll just take Kathleen because there's no problems and I don't have to hire extra cops and security and the, the show costs go way down and Kathleen's nice and agreeable. Well, I would hire me. Yeah. So when they say Bill got canceled, it was a consequence of the situation. It wasn't somebody just going, you're canceled. 
it was like, you know what, dude, you've become too much of a pain in our ass to handle it. And there you go. Don't be a pain in the ass. That, oh, that would be my that, recommendation. By the way, that's, that's brilliant, as is taking the middle seats to slow down the ushers. How great is that? Because the old people can't, they can't get to you. And they had signs. Like there was like 20 in a row. But those theaters in Florida, that row could be 40 seats long. Yes. It's so yes. smart. <laughs> but then this is where you're a comic and you're an observational person. I'm not paying attention to the protesters or their signs. I'm like, that is so smart to buy the middle. I would have never thought about that. I never would have thought about that. Good, good <laughs> no. to know. When you're on the road, my mother had weird things. Like when she was on the road, because she was on the road a lot, certain things made her, were like her touchstones that made her feel at home in so many different hotels and so many different places. She always kept the TV on, on forensic files or law and order, which is that she was like, I wake up in the middle of the night, Jerry Orbach's on solving a crime. All is good. Um, she also, but that's different. She liked to rearrange the furniture in hotels. So it was more aesthetically pleasing. Um, what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have, that takes more energy than I have for a marriage. What, what do you bring? What do you do? Um, I think it's usually probably find after the show, an old Irish pub where I feel like I'm in a, a bar bar, like a real, it doesn't have to be an Irish bar, but I prefer it. Uh, I'm, I moved on from your mom's law and order to the ID channel, which is just murder, 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 murder. And I guess the murdering, um, makes me feel like everything's fine in my life. I mean, this is fear yeah. thy neighbor and somebody's neighbor is attacking them out of nowhere. And my neighbors are super nice. So that it makes show, you feel better about yourself. Doesn't yeah, it? it? It's just, it leads a whole different idea of the day. And then I don't know. I like sports center and it's always the same guys in, in the women. So then I'm like, Oh, there's my little friends from sports center, but I don't really have a lot of uh, like ticks or even pre-show because people are like, oh, you're probably busy before the show. I'm like, if you only knew. I'm not busy. I'm on Instagram looking at pictures of my cat. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not busy. I know exactly what I'm doing. Nothing, yeah, no. I think people think it's, I don't know, maybe more complicated than it is. Than at least it is to me. Is there any way you haven't performed that you would still love to? Uh well, I would like to do more of Canada, but then the paperwork's always so hard. I'm just like, I don't know. I would love to go to Nova Scotia and do it, okay. but I just, I just want to go there. But I mean, I would do a show too, if I could. That's tax deductible. Yeah, right. And then I could have fun and do that. Um, no, I think I've done everywhere in the States and I've done a lot of Europe. I always find that awkward. I don't realize how American I am until I go there. And then I'm like, oh, my God, now I got to ask all these people if they know this serial killer I'm talking about. You know, like my act, as it turns out, is pretty North American. But like I do, I, I did Ireland every year for a ton of years. They get it. But like Lewis goes to like Denmark and I'm like, oh, I, I don't I'd rather just fight people in Alabama. Yeah. So you, don't you know, I mean. Much. I don't want to go through all the, the thing. Yeah. Can't you just go there on vacation, Lou? Why no. do we? No. No. Got to work. <laughs> Let's talk about Hunting Bigfoot, which is your sixth special. And I had mentioned that earlier. That is, to have six specials, I cannot even begin to imagine the amount of material you go through to get to those specials, let alone six times. But over all those years, it's not, I'm not as fast as a lot of people out there. But then like my mom started giving me shit and COVID was happening. She's like, you haven't had a new special in a long time. I go, mom, Chardet hasn't had an album in 12 years and I don't hear her mom bitching at her. What, <laughs> why don't you just settle down there, mom? <laughs> Be quiet. I said, it, it sh there's other people that are doing like one a year. And when I hear like on Netflix, I will not mention names, but there will be comedians that are like, oh, he's got a four special deal. What is happening? Nobody can do a special a year. I do not believe that unless you hire 50 writers. And then what are you doing? Because to me, the whole joy of stand up is I get to say what I want to say. Not jokes I wrote, no, or that someone else wrote. If you wrote them, then it's your jokes. 
I don't want your jokes. You, what, I don't, I don't know. It seems to work for some people, but when I'm like, oh my God, if anybody said to me, hey, we're going to give you a four special deal, I'd say, no, 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 no. I don't know what I'm going to be doing a year from now. No, it's too much of a, it's like a straight jacket. Like, how am I supposed to be sure that I'm going to think of that much funny stuff? Well, and that it'll work. Right. I have to go out there and do that and make sure it works over and over and over, not just, well, it worked in Des Moines. <laughs> like you can't, <laughs> I need to know for sure it's going to work in Des Moines and Los Angeles and Baltimore and everywhere. When you're on the road so much that you clearly love, how hard was it being in lockdown? Well, that was kind of um, super, I, I hate to say I had a bun because like my, I have sisters and cousins that they're teachers and nurses and their lives are terrible, but I was just told to stay home and I haven't been home in, uh, I don't know, 30 years. So I was like, yeah, uh, Ron White my, and Lewis came down here. We all went golfing. And Ron goes, isn't it amazing how seamlessly we've slipped into retirement? I said, yeah, <laughs> I said, so far I'm good. But I, I don't know, I guess maybe after like six months, I was like, okay, I'm getting, I cleaned all the closets. I know what's in the attic. Uh, I'm good now. I did everything you always say you want to do on a rainy day. And then I'm like, okay. So I was happy that we got started, but I didn't go till it was for sure open because there were a lot of people that are like, well, you can come and we're 50 percent capacity. And you know, no, the audience is going to have mask on. No. What are we doing? Just calm down. It's going to be fine. And just you, stay home. And that's sort of when you started your podcast. Yeah, I was just totally bored. And my siblings, I was, gonna say, was it was it out of boredom or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it was out of. Every comedian, whether all my little comedian friends, totally boring because they're not doing anything. And then my siblings, who would be my next round of calls, have real jobs. So they don't want to talk to me about the cobra that's loose in Texas. And I, that's what I wanted to talk about. That I want to talk about this story I read and no one would take my call. <laughs> like, my brother's like, I have a job. And he <laughs> Like, oh, sorry, Mr. Fancy Financial Advisor. Um, I So I just thought, well, I'm just going to read these weird stories that I find online and just talk. And it seems like people like like that. So, yeah, I don't I don't really understand any of it, but they like it. Well, you are so funny. Everybody needs to watch the special, listen to the podcast, Hunting Bigfoot. And... Uh, uh, was it Madigan's pub cast? And I'd ask what you are doing next, but it's probably two nights at the Crown Plaza in Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's New Orleans. I don't even know. Yeah, I think New Orleans. No, Memphis? No, New Orleans. I'm going there you go. Yeah, yeah. Kathleen Madigan, thank you so much. All right, good talking to you. Bye, guys. <laughs>